Uh, this is part two of the main presentation of prophecies concerning Muhammad in the Bible. Let's do a little bit of review quickly. Um, remember in First Peter, Second Peter, chapter one, verse sixteen through twenty, uh, we saw that the prophecies are more sure than even a voice from heaven. So, and if it's more sure than a voice from heaven, then it's more sure than anything else you could possibly read. Uh, the prophecies is where you need to go to to find the truth. Um, concerning anything that they speak about yeah, so can you see if they speak about Islam and what it is that they actually say prophecies um, outrule anything is they're more sure than even a voice from heaven according to the Bible and remember in the Quran we read um, that uh, the prediction or its statement that Jesus received a book uh, from God and that this book mentions um, Muhammad and we saw in Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 that uh, Jesus did indeed receive a book from God and it is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation identifies itself as a book that Jesus received from God. And one of the things I want to make clear before we really get into it is um, the, the basic concepts what I'm presenting here are really not very new. Um, they're uh, fairly normal in Protestantism up until uh, up through the 19th century. The idea that Revelation chapter 9 uh, talks about Muhammad and the rise of Islam, uh, it's only been fairly recently historically um, with Protestants getting away from the historicist interpretation um, that this idea has kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, but one example is in uh, Uriah Smith's book, um, Daniel Revelation, he says, For an exposition of this trumpet, the, the fifth trumpet in Revelation 9, we shall again turn, uh, draw from the writings of Mr. Keith. This water writer truthfully says, there is, so scarce, there is scarcely so uniform an agreement among interpreters concerning any other part of the Apocalypse, Book of Revelation, as respecting the application of the fifth and sixth trumpets, or the first and second was to the Saracens, i.e. the Arabs um, and Turks. It is so obvious that it can scarcely be misunderstood. Instead of a verse or two designating each, the whole of the ninth chapter of Revelation in equal portions is occupied with a description of both. Uh, so the interpretation that, or the idea that Revelation 9 describes the rise of Islam uh, what was actually quite mainstream among Protestants up uh, into the 19th century. What is exceptionally different about what's being presented here is whether uh, the Bible um, is being favorable or uh, unfavorable to them. Um, where is, whether the Bible is describing their um, rise as being an act of God or an act of Satan. Let's uh, take a look. Now, this all starts back in Revelation chapter 8, uh, verse 2. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came up with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Now, the visions of Revelation were given a few day, decades after the destruction of Jerusalem. And I believe the imagery above, the altar incense prayer, connects uh, the beginnings of the trumpets to the temple services on earth and God's sanctuary in heaven. Kind of links them both. Um, but specifically, uh, it's going into the uh, destruction of Jerusalem. And we'll see that in a second here. In Exodus chapter 30, uh, verses 1 through 8, um, you got a description of uh, the sanctuary there, and you'll see that um, you got the altar, the incense, and everything um, matches quite well with the description of the sanctuary. And in uh, Psalms chapter 141, verse 2, it says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the off lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So you even got the 
um, idea mentioned in uh, Revelation 8 about the mixing of the incense with the prayers of the saints. Now we need to have another thing to kind of anchor the time period about when this is supposed to take place. Um, we find that the uh, end of the 1260 day period uh, that we saw in the previous uh, video, uh, that that 1260 day period ends during the sixth trumpet and it's here. Um, in Revelation 11 verses 1 through 3 and then skipping down to 14 and 15 and has given to me a reed like unto a rod and an angel standing saying rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and the worship therein by the court that which is without the temple leave out to measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand uh, 203 score days and most of that vision is actually taking place after that 1200 or most of that section in Revelation chapter 11 um, is taking place after the 1260 days um, so the 1260 day period ends during that um, section in Revelation 11 and we see that that is immediately before the seventh trumpet sounds which means that this take place, takes place during the sixth trumpet uh, the 1260 day period comes to an end during the sixth trumpet in verses 14 and 15 we read the second woe is passed and behold the third woe cometh quickly and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kings, kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever so this just gives us an anchor there um, the trumpets begin about the time of the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem by the Romans and uh, continue on up until uh, the seventh trumpet which is uh, when God establishes the kingdom but the sixth trumpet the 1260 day period ends during the sixth trumpet so the uh, fifth trumpet uh, takes place before that 1260 day period ends and the sixth trumpet um, at least starts before that 1260 day period ends now we read in Revelation 8 verses 6 through 7 and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound their first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees is burned up and the third part of the grass is burnt up now these symbols are used to, um, with both God's judgment on the wicked and the first destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians um, back in the 6th century BC um, in Exodus chapter 9 Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire to rain down upon the ground and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt so there was hail and fire mingled with hail very grievous such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation so you've got the um, being connected with the judgments in Ezekiel chapter 13 verses 10 through 16 because even they have seduced my people saying peace when there was no peace and one um, built up a wall and lo others daubed it with untempered mortar say unto them the daub it with untempered mortar it shall fall and shall be an overflowing shower and ye great hailstones shall fall and, great, and stormy wind shall rend it lo when the wall is fallen shall it be said unto you where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed it therefore thus saith the Lord God I will even rend it with the stormy wind and my fury and there shall be an overflowing shower and my anger and great hailstones and fire to, and my fury to consume it so I break down the wall that ye have daubed with the untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so the, the foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall and ye shall be consumed in the midst thereof and ye shall know that I am the Lord thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with the untempered mortar and I will say unto you that the wall is no more neither they that daubed it to wit the prophets of Israel prophesy concerning Jerusalem uh, which see the visions of peace for her and there is no peace saith the Lord God so you've got both judgments in general um, and specifically judgments of God on Jerusalem when it's destroyed the first time 
In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 22, we're going to get a little bit from 6, 7, 9, and 29. For thus saith the Lord unto the king's house of Judah, I will prepare destroyers against thee, every one with his weapons, and they shall cut down thy choice seers and cast them into the fire, because thou hast forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshipped other gods. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. In uh, 2 Kings chapter 9, 19, verse 26, Therefore their inhabitants were a small power, and they were dismayed and confounded. There was the grass of the field, and the green herb, and grass on the housetops, as the corn blasted before it grew up. You got all these symbols here, uh, linked with the destruction of Jerusalem the first time, and judgments of God in general, um, in the first trumpet. Um, so, if the if those uh, symbols were used with the first in the first trumpet with Jerusalem's first destruction, then it uh, makes sense. <laughs> They would also be used to describe Jerusalem's second destruction by the Romans. Um, and then, right after that, another thing linking that in uh, Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea had life and died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now, the first Part would seem to represent the destruction of Rome as a great burning mountain sinking into the sea, and remember, and uh, which was used to symbolize the destruction of Babylon after it destroyed Israel. Remember, Babylon destroyed Jerusalem the first time, and then Babylon was destroyed. Rome destroyed Jerusalem the second time, and then Rome was destroyed. And these same symbols we saw used with Babylon after it, and linked with its destruction. And we see them here also linked with Rome concerning its destruction. In Jeremiah chapter 51, we're going to look at verses 24, 25, 42, 49, 55, and 64 to see how these same symbols were used to describe the destruction of Babylon after it destroyed Jerusalem the first time. And so we can see that these are. Um, very appropriately for describing the destruction of Jerusalem of Rome after it destroyed Jerusalem the second time. Uh, in verse 24 and 25 we read, And I will render unto Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight, saith the Lord. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroys all the earth. And I will stretch up my hand upon thee, and roll thee down from the rocks, and will make thee a burnt mountain. Verse 42, The sea is to come up upon, upon Babylon, she is covered with the multitude of ways thereof. Verse 49, As Babylon hath caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon shall fall the slain of all the earth. Um, verse 55, Because the Lord hath spoiled Babylon, and uh, destroyed out of her great voice, when her ways do roar with great ways, and the noise of her uh, voice is uttered. So verse 64, Thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and the noise uh, shall not and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. It's very also very appropriate that um, we're not going to have time to really get into it here, but in Revelation chapter 18, um, it describes uh, Rome and specifically the papal Rome um, as Babylon. So it's very appropriate that God's using these same symbols that He had used for um, Babylon before. Uh, now the phrase uses the the verse uses the phrase third part several times. As the Roman Empire broke up, there were three main parts: uh, the Latin West, the Greek East, and the North Africa. The Western regions fell to Germanic hands, uh, which generally resisted the Islamic invasion. Germanic invaders conquered North Africa. These were in turn conquered by the Islamic invaders. Um, but the Greek Byzantine Eastern Empire held out against the invading tribes and the initial Islamic expansion. Uh, this did not change until the Muslims were united in, under a single political force that would become the Ottoman Empire. Now, the first four trumpets seem to be focused on the Latin West, um, that kind of third part there. Um, I'm not entirely satisfied that that's necessarily the best interpretation, but it's kind of something I'm working with right now. Um, maybe some, maybe a better one will come up uh, sometime in the future. 
but the destruction of the ships seems to symbolize the destruction of the wealth and commerce. Uh, one of the tribes dealt to Delhi and uh, low to the Roman Empire was the Vandals. They conquered North Africa and they engaged in many sea battles with the Romans, finally sacking Rome itself. They were a great naval force in the Mediterranean. The ships of, in Ezekiel chapter 27 verses 25 and tw through 27 read um, kind of justification for this. The ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market, and thou wast replenished, and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. The rowers have brought thee into great waters, and the east wind hath broken thee in the midst of the seas. Thy riches, and thy fares, thy merchandise, thy mariners, and thy pilots, thy conquerors, and the occupiers of thy merchandise, and all the men of war are in thee, and all thy company which is in the midst of thee shall fall in the midst of the seas in the day of thy ruin. Now, uh, let's continue on. And the third angel sounded, and there was a, fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, um, upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many uh, men died at the waters because of uh, they were made bitter. Now, the star falls from heaven. The star falls from heaven, indicating that started out good, but became corrupted. Now, the lamp symbolizes the word of God. However, uh, the description of the lamp is preceded by the phrase, as it were. This would seem to indicate there's no longer the true word of God. Uh, now, we read in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23, that that commandment is a lamp, the law is a light, and reproofs, instruction of the way. Psalm 119, 105, the word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. That's where we get the interpretation that the lamp um, symbolizes the word of God. But this is not the true word of God. Here. The true gospel message produces rivers of water. In uh, John chapter 7, Jesus said, In the last day, the great uh, day of the feast, Jesus said, stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. However, this star falls in the gospel truth. It turns truth to wormwood. Uh, and wormwood, according to the Bible, is as well as this way. In Jeremiah chapter 9, we read, And the word saith, Because thy they have forsaken my law, that I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein. But have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and left to Balaam, which the fathers taught them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink. Amos chapter 5, you read, You turn judgment to wormwood, and leave off righteousness in the earth. So this is a corrupted form of the gospel. This is not what Jesus actually taught. We saw in prophecy in Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 that after the breakup of the Western Roman Empire, the medieval Christian church would become a major political power. Remember, this is how the Bible describes the church, symbolized by the little horn in Daniel 7 and the beast in Revelation. Uh, just a small recap of what we saw before. Uh, I beheld in the same age war with the saints and prevailed against them, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time, times, and dividing of time. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war against him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power it was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven is given unto him to make a war with the saints and overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. His names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundations of the world. Verse 18. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred and three score and six. Revelation 14, 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment shall ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whose 
and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. The medieval Christian church taught a religion based on tradition rather than the word of God. Their teachings sounded like they were based on the word of God, but they led people away from the truth. Jesus' true teachings gave life, which Jesus described as living water. But the church's false teachings turned that water into wormwood. The church blasphemed against God and persecuted the saints who were worshiping God as Jesus taught. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for the third part of it, and night likewise. And I beheld an angel flying in the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of their voices of the trumpet of the three angels, uh, which are yet to sound. After the truth of the gospel was turned into wormwood, a uh, light of false, uh, the light of truth faded across Western Europe, one of the three major parts of the Roman Empire. The Christian world had taken the pure gospel that Jesus had preached and twisted it into something evil. The angel announces three woes to the inhabitants of the earth. The darkening of the moon, sun, moon, and stars are a part of the judgment that God sends on the wicked people. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9 through 7. We read, Behold, the day, com day of the Lord cometh, uh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and going forth, and the moon shall ca not cause her light to shine. And I'll punish the world for the evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I'll cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and I will lay low the haughtiness of this terrible, of the terrible. The false, uh, I mean, we see that the false teachings of the church plunge Europe into spiritual darkness. And according to prophecy, the corrupt church be would begin its reign, would reign on its main part from 538 to 1798, over the 260 day period from the previous video. Muhammad was born around 570, three decades after the corrupt ch church's reign began. Now we get to Revelation chapter 9. Um, and on the ESV, it reads, And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth, and he was given the key of the shaft of the bottomless pit. And on the K King James translation, it reads, And the fifth angel saw, sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Um, the reason that the ESV translates it as fallen is because it actually is in past tense in the Greek. Um, I'm not sure why the King James translate as fall, but it's in the past tense, indicating that the star fell before um, this trumpet blew, fell at a previous time. So it's coming from a fallen background. <coughs> now let's get a meaning into some symbols before we really plunge in too far into it. Uh, what do stars mean? Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 the mystery of the seven stars which I saw in the right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which I saw of the seven churches so a star represents an angel um, the word in Greek in this translated as angel literally means messenger so a star is an angel and or messenger depending on how you translate it so a star is a messenger uh, Revelation chapter 20 verse 1 through 3, 3. And I saw an angel come down, come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain was in his hand. And they laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were fulfilled. And after that it must be loose a little season. Now this is a, a different event, but you see almost identical symbols. So you got a very strong parallel there. Um, and this angel is definitely fighting against Satan. Um, this angel comes down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit, whereas in um, Revelation 9-1 uh, it's given the key to the bottomless pit at, uh, after it had already fallen. Or after it had uh, uh, star that had fallen previously was given the key to the bottom. So it coming star came from fallen background. Uh, 
Now, we need to understand the meaning of the word bottomless, the phrase bottomless pit. It's translated from the Greek word abusu. Um, and it's used in a number of ways. Uh, one is uh, in the dead, the realm of the dead. Um, Revelation chapter, Romans chapter 10, verse 7, we read, For who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ from the dead. The word translated deep is abusu, is abusum. The same word. Um, so when Christ arose from the dead, he ascended up out of the bottomless pit. Uh, well, translated that way. Uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, in the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament, we read, um, But the earth was unseen and unready, and darkness upon the abyss. The same word, abusu. And the spirit of God bore upon the water. Uh, so, what, so which way do we translate here? In Revelation chapter 19, verse 21, it says, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So, you've got an earth um, where you've got mass, an earth in kind of a destroyed, unstable. Um, largely uninhabited um, uh, state and uh, this is the precursor to Revelation chapter 20 um, that we just read that very closely parallels uh, Revelation chapter 9 verse 1 so this is probably the meaning of the word abusu uh, that most that actually fits uh, Revelation 9-1, a empty, empty region, empty place. Um, now in Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, uh, just to get the meaning of the word keys, uh, verses 8, 13, and 18, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girded about the paths with a golden girdle. Verse 18. I am he that liveth and is dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I am man, and have the keys of hell and death. So a key represents power. Jesus has power over hell and death here. That's what the key symbolizes, according to the Bible. Now we have the meanings of the primary symbols for verse 1. But we need to, um, before we move on to verse 2, we need and look at them both together, we need to find out the primary meaning or the meaning of symbols of the uh, smoking furnace and darkness. Now there's three places, exactly three places in all of the Bible where the smoking furnace and darkness appears. Uh, one is in Revelation chapter 9 verse 2 and uh, we're going to right now look at the other two to get the biblical interpretation of those symbols. Not the church's interpretation, not your pastor's interpretation, not any my interpretation not my interpretation not any person's interpretation the bible's interpretation we need to let the bible tell us what these mean if we don't believe what the bible says then our interpret then our understanding is by definition unbiblical and here's the uh first place where the that combination appears the smoking furnace and darkness in Genesis chapter 15, we read a story about Abraham back before his name was changed to Abraham was when it was Abram. <coughs> and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he, God is speaking, said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with a great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in good old age. When the fourth generation thou shalt come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun came down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and burning lamp that passed between these pieces. And that same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of uh, of Egypt into the great river, the river Euphrates. Now here's the key, key things. Um, notice that the deep sleep fell upon Abram and a horror of great darkness fell upon him back at the beginning. 
the sun doesn't go down to quite a bit later. So this is in fact a pour of great darkness which covers up the sun. That blots out the sun. And look at what else um, we see. When in combination of that darkness that covers the sun, we see the smoking uh, furnace. And when you see the combination of the smoking furnace and darkness covering the sun, God makes the covenant with Abraham. God speaks there. That is God's presence. Now, and it's very important. God is the one who appears to Abraham when you see the smoking furnace and the darkness covering the sun. Now, God kept his promise to Abraham, Abraham and brought his descendants up out of Egypt. And God brought them to Mount Sinai. And God revealed to them the law, which is the first part of the Bible. That's the origins of the Bible. It's traced to Mount Sinai. And what do we see on Mount Sinai when God is renewing the covenant with the children of Israel and is giving the law, which became the foundation of the Bible, to Moses? In Exodus chapter 19, we read, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended on, upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. So you got the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountains quaked greatly. Chapter 20, verse 21. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near under the thick darkness where God was. Let that sink in for a second. The thick darkness that results from the smoke of the furnace is where God was. Not Satan. God. And you'll see in a second why I said not Satan, God. This is where God was. And this is where God gave Moses the law, which became the foundations of the Bible. The Bible traces its origin to the smoking furnace and darkness. This is where the Bible comes from. Now, those are the only pl other places where you see the smoking furnace in the darkness, but you do see smoke in darkness a couple other places. We need to look at those. In 2 Samuel uh, chapter 22, In my distress I called upon the Lord, and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did, hear into, did enter into his e ears. Then the earth shook and trembled, and the foundations of heaven moved and shook, because he was wroth. And there went up smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured coals, uh, devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed his the heavens also and came down. The darkness was under his feet. The darkness and smoke, the smoke and darkness in that combination is connected here with the direct physical presence of God. Not Satan, God. Joel chapter 2. I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, um, blood and fire and pillows of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. And it shall come to pass, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be delivered, as the Lord hath said, and in remnant whom the Lord shall call. Again, the sun turned into the darkness and the smoke from um, the day of the Lord. This is God's doing. In uh, Revelation chapter 8, just what does smoke mean? Uh, in, the, in the same vision of the trumpets and the smoke of the incense which came over the prayers of the saints is centered up before God out of the angel's hand so you have the smoke the smoke just by itself is connected with the prayers of the saints in Revelation chapter 15 verse 8 we read and the temple is filled with smoke from the glory of God it says here plainly say the smoke came from the glory of God and from his power and no man was able to enter in the temple the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Again, smoke connected with the physical presence of God. And smoke is often connected with the God's actions in prayer, with God's presence, God's actions, or prayer. Smoke and darkness, that combination is always 100% of the time connected with God's presence or God's actions. Now, the smoky furnace and darkness is always 100% connected with God giving his messages to his prophets never anything else. And take a look. 
go go look through the Bible. Go look through for the uh, times when smoke appears, and you'll never see it used in. You'll see darkness by itself occasionally used in connection with um, wickedness or things like that. Darkness by itself, but never smoke. Never, ever, ever, not once. And the combination of the smoke and the darkness always connected with the presence of God. And the smoking furnace in darkness only, only, only connected with God giving messages to his prophets in the rest of the Bible. Revelation chapter 9, we're going to go ahead and read 1 and 2. Using the interpretations that the Bible has provided. Um, and the fifth angel blew his trumpet and saw a star, or a messenger, fallen from heaven to the earth. He came from a people that had fallen away from God. He came from a fallen background. And he was given the key, which is authority or power, to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Remember we talked about how um, the bottomless pit, if you use this with the um, similar um, uh, vision, Revelation chapter 20, um, there the abyss, bottomless pit, Abusu, describes a world that's um, been, where the people have been killed, it's, it's kind of emptied. And Arabia is known as the empty quarter, historically, um, been known as the empty quarter. He opened, and continuing on verse 2, he opened the shaft of the bottom of his pit, and from the shaft rose the smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Using the in, uh, interpretations given by the Bible, the only interpretations given by the Bible for this is God communicating with his messenger or prayer, and God, God's actions, God's presence. But specifically, the shaft of the or the, the smoke of the great furnace and darkness. If you want to be really technical, the only time you saw the combination of the smoking furnace and darkness covering the sun, or it actually says covering the sun, is in God's covenant with Abraham. Um, when Protestants uh, interpreted this uh, Revelation chapter 9 as being about the rise of Islam they always tried to say that this um, indicated uh, deceptions of Satan or the guess Satan was behind it or things like that those interpretations don't come from the Bible they're not biblical this is not what the Bible says I showed you what the Bible says look through the Bible for yourself search through it search for smoke you will not find Anytime where smoke is used in connection with um, ungodliness or Satan. Like I said, there are a couple times that darkness is, but never when it's combined with smoke. And the smoke is the primary uh, symbol here. So if you want to look for an interpretation, it has to be either smoke or smoke combined with darkness. It cannot, uh, darkness by itself doesn't actually apply here. And even. Uh, but when you see the smoke combined with the darkness, always the physical presence of God, and the smoke of the uh, smoking furnace in darkness, always combined with God communicating with his messengers, and if you want to be real technical, the smoking furnace in darkness covering the sun, only once seen elsewhere when God made his covenant with Abraham. There's no possible way using the Bible to interpret this as being deceptions of Satan or false religion or anything like that. It is impossible. Anyone that says that is not showing you a biblical interpretation because it doesn't exist in the Bible. Search through it. See for yourself. It's This is the only biblical interpretation. This is the only interpretation that has support from the Bible. These are the only interpretations for the symbols that have support from the Bible. Let's continue on. Verses 3 through 6. And there came out the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it's commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. 
have made and it was and to them it was given that they should not kill them but they, they should be tormented five months and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he struck at the man and in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them now what is the purpose what does their actual mean their uh, goal and let's skip ahead just for a second to verses 20 and 21. And the rest of the men which were not killed by those plagues, yet repented not of the works of the hands, that they should not worship devils, or in idols of gold, and silver, and brass, and stone, and wood, neither can see, nor hear, nor walk, nor repented they of the murders, nor the sorceries, nor their fornication, nor the thefts. The entire purpose of the fifth of the um, two parts of Revelation chapter 9 is to get men to repent from the wickedness. Again, Satan doesn't try to get men to repent from the wickedness. God does. That is their purpose, is to get men to repent of the wickedness. Specifically, remember this is coming up in the time period when the medieval Christian church is under the, um, is blaspheming against God. It's evil. And the purpose of the events in Revelation chapter 9 is to get them to repent of the wickedness. Now let's look at uh, why they're referred to as locusts. Uh, let's look back in the Bible for the answer. In Judges chapter 6, um, we read about the Midianites, who are also descendants of Abraham and ancestors, one of the ancestors of the Arabs. And the children of Israel did evil uh, in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the the Midian prevailed against Israel because the Midianites. The children of Israel made them dens which were in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel was, was uh, had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east. Um, look at the map. East of uh, Canaan. Look to the east. That's uh, Arabia. Uh, Presently Jordan and Saudi Arabia, but all that land was Arabia. Referred to as Arabia in ancient times. <coughs> so these are the Arabs and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till they come to Gaza left no sustenance for Israel neither sheep nor ox nor ass for they came up with the cattle in the tents and they came up as grasshoppers grasshoppers technically not locusts but you're in the same family it's pretty much the same symbol they're described as grasshoppers they came up as grasshoppers for multitude for they both they and the camels were without, were without number and they entered into the land to destroy it Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel and said to them thus saith the Lord God of Israel I brought you up out of Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all their oppressed to you and drove you out from before you and gave you their land and I said unto you I am the Lord their God fear not the gods of the Amorites in this land that you dwell but you have not obeyed my voice this is a punishment brought from, by God against the people because they did not obey him this is the parallel when you look in the Bible now who are the Midianites it's very important here um, exactly who they were and then Abraham took a wife, his name was Keturah, and she bare him Zimram, Jukshan, uh, Medim, Midian, Ibshak, and Shua. And that's in Genesis chapter 25. Now, in Genesis chapter 37, verses 27 and 36, we see the Midianites, their, kind of, their name is kind of interchangeable with the Ishmaelites. And 27, we read, Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Verse 36, And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, and the captain of the guard. So the Midianites and Ishmaelites were kind of uh, interchangeable. It, it doesn't explain exactly why, um, possibly through intermarriage. That's um, just a theory. Um, but they were close enough that uh, the, those two um, peoples were close enough that their names were kind of interchangeable there. And we need to keep in mind that uh, the Midianites, um, at one point, great numbers of them did worship the true God. 
out of Abraham. Uh, Moses' Moses's father-in-law has not only priest of Midian, but also made sacrifices with Moses to the true God. Um, chapter Genesis 18, verse 1. When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses for and for Israel his people, and that the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, now in verse 12, we read, And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God, and Aaron came, and all the elders of Israel, to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. So they actually not only worship the true God, but they actually had an organized religion. Organized to at least enough that there was priests. Both predating and in parallel to uh, the foundations of Judaism and this um, religion worshiped the true God. How does this uh, does this uh, lend credence to the claim that Muhammad made that he was trying to bring the descendants of Ishmael, the descendants of the uh, Arabs, which included the Midianites, Ishmaelites, and all the other children of Abraham, back to the worship of the true God, saying that he was trying to bring them back to a religion that they had once practiced? Now, God actually uh, had a very special place in his heart for Ishmael. Um, it seems to be ignored in, Judeo, in Judaism and Christianity, but God has a special place for him. Genesis chapter 16, verses 7 through 13. Um, and Hagar was, uh, ran away when she was pregnant with Ishmael. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, and it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shall cause name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he shall be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And his name, and she called the name of uh, the Lord that spake unto her, Now God seeth me, for she said, Here I also have looked after him that seeth me. And it's very interesting. Um, God sends the angel to... Hagar, before Ishmael's born, um, to give her advice, make sure Ishmael was taken care of, and actually told Hagar what to name Ishmael. This is very unusual. Uh, look through the Bible, you'll find that uh, this is a very rare privilege. Uh, an angel appeared before child was born just a few more times. Isaac was one. John the Baptist was one. And Jesus was one. And here we have Ishmael. Same honor. And in fact, he was the first. He was the first person, recorded anyway, that God actually sent the angel to the parents before the child was born and said, you must name the child this name. God took that much of an interest in Ishmael. Um, when discussing Ishmael to Abraham, God said, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him a fruitful, and I will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes so shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. When God speaking to Abraham. Now, later on, um, uh, after Ishmael and Isaac were born, there's more problems between Sarah and Hagar. Uh, God told Abraham to go ahead and let um, Hagar go. In uh, Genesis chapter 21, verse 14 through 20. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and water for a bottle and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder. And the child and sent her away, and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water spent in the bottle. She cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and sat head down over against him away off as it were a bow shot for she said let 
may not see the, uh, the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of the Lord, angel of God, uh, called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him in thine hand, for thou make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. So we here, see here that uh, angel appeared a second time to protect and guide Hagar. Make sure that Ishmael was taken care of. Make sure that Hagar and Ishmael survived. God had a vested interest in making sure that Ishmael, ancestor of Muhammad, survived. Ancestor of the Arabs. Made sure they survived. And people... Um, look down on uh, the Arabs and everything today and say all sorts of evil things against them. This is what the Bible says. This is where Ishmael comes from. This is where Muhammad's ancestry comes from. Now let's continue on in Revelation chapter 9. And it has commanded them that they should, well, actually we already read this, but let's um, delve into that. And it has commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And this is very interesting because it, this is actually a summary of a speech that Abu Bakr, um, uh, Muhammad's uh, successor after Muhammad died, gave um, to the uh, Muslims. This is a, actually a summary of an actual speech given to the Muslims uh, by uh, Muhammad's successor. Uh, and Edward Gibbon records it. Uh, it's in Old English translation, which I refers to the Muslims as Mohammedans, and it translates it that way, but pay attention. Um, when you fight the battles of the Lord, acquit yourselves like men without turning your backs, let not your victory be stained with the blood of women or children, destroy no palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn, cut down no free trees, nor do any mischief to the cattle, only such as you kill to eat, when you have made a covenant or article to stand on it, and be as good as your word, and go on and you'll find some religious persons who have retired to monasteries, and propose to themselves to serve God, that that way let them alone, and neither kill them, nor destroy their monasteries, and you will find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan, who are shaven crowns. Be sure you cleave their skulls, and give them no quarter till they either turn Mohammedans or Muslims, or pay tribute. So, um, we see that Revelation chapter 9 actually very uh, appropriately summarizes that speech. And important here is, who is it that they are supposed to fight against? Only against the men who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. Satan does not tell his servants to only attack the people that are not the followers of God. The God is the only one that gives those, those kinds of commands. If they are commanded not to attack those who have the seal of God, not to attack those who are the, fo the true followers of God, that they are told to attack only those who are not the true followers of God, Satan does not make those kinds of commands. God makes those commands. It doesn't even begin to make sense to try to say that Satan was behind that. The reason I'm going, going back and back to that is because even though um, the Islamic interpretation of Revelation chapter 9 was quite um, quite widespread up into the 19th century, it was always interpreted in, in such a way as to make the Islam sound evil and satanic. But I'm trying to show you what the Bible says and not what uh, tradition says. Um, but this is another proof, um, very strong, showing that this uh, is applying to this time period and these people. Um, this is not 
uh, just one more very solid anchor there. Uh, the fact that it actually summarizes a speech by Abu Bakr um, get, provides you a very solid anchor showing that this actually is talking about the right the um, early Islamic period here. Continuing on. It has given them that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and the torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the scorpion locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, were as it were heads crowns like gold, and the faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and the teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as they were the breastplates of iron, and the sound of the wings was as the sound of chariots, and many horses running to battle, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and their stings in their tails, and the power was to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them which is the angel of the bottom's pit. His name is in the Hebrew tongue Abaddon, who, but in the Greek tongue his name hath his name Apollyon. Now the words Abaddon and Apollyon are both translated as destroyer. So we have an angel of the bottom's pit whose name is destroyer. So let's look to the Bible for the interpretation. What, what do destroying angels do in the Bible? Exodus chapter 12 verse 23 for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into the house into your houses to smite you so the story here works for God destroying the Egyptians first Chronicles 21 15 and God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem but this angel but as the angel was doing so the Lord saw it and relented concerning the disaster and said to the angel who is destroying the people enough withdraw your hand and the angel of the Lord was in standing at the threshing floor of um, and we're now at the Jebusite again destroying angel works for God not Satan there's another thing people try to twist and say that um, that this is an evil force because it talks about a destroying angel. But the destroying angels here work for God. They don't work for Satan according to the Bible. If you actually want to believe the Bible. Second Kings chapter 19. It came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred, four score, and five thousand. And when they rose in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So we again have here the destroying angel works for God. It's not an evil force. And just kind of going back to that. And it was given them that they should not kill them, that they should be tormented five months, and the torment says the torment of scorpion when he strike of the man, and then those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared in the battle. And all the heads were as it were the heads of crown, and the faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of the lions. And they had breastplates as it were the breastplates of iron, and the sound of the wings as the wing sounds of a chariot of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and their stings were in the tails, and the power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, his name in the Hebrew tongue Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now, when is the five months? Um, this is the five months that takes place before, and it's listed here before they mentions the king. So um, let's look for a five month period. And remember, five months equals 150 days, and we saw before in the time prophecies that uh, with a day for a year. So let's uh, take a look here. Um, when Look here for a time when the Muslims after Muhammad were actually united. And when we look in history, you find them first really united together and attacking the Roman Empire when they're under the leadership of the Ottomans. Um, and they began their attack on the Eastern Roman Empire, according to Edward Gibbon on the 27th of July in 1299. So he, he writes, it was on the 27th of July in the year 1299 of the Christian era, the Othman, um, the first Ottoman leader, 
first invaded the, the territory of Negamedia, the Eastern Roman Empire, or part of that ter territory there. And the singular accuracy of the date seems to disclose any, some foresight of the rapid destructive growth of the monster. Um, so, and remember it said that they were tormented for five months, um, but were not killed. So let's look up, look for a five month period right up and before they kill one of the, and just kind of keep all this in mind. Um, John Paleologus, the Byzantine emperor, emperor, the next to the last one, died in 1449. His brother Constantine had to obtain permission from the Turkish Sultan in, or, in order to become emperor. Uh, this marked the end of the political independence of the Byzantine Empire 150 years after um, Ottoman began his conquest, or five months. Byzantine Emperor was not killed at this time. Remember the five months they were tormented but not killed. Let's continue on. One woe was passed, and uh, continue on verse twelve through twenty one. One woe was passed, and behold there came two there come two uh, woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which hath the trumpet, Loose the four angels which abound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, and were, which were prepared for a day and an hour and a month and a year for to slay. Remember before this torment, be here the slay, the third part of men, slay that third part of the old Roman Empire, the, the Eastern Roman Empire, as it is, or the Byzantine Empire, as it's often called. And the number of the horsemen was 200,000, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in vision, and then sat on them, having breastplates of fire, not just fire, but fire now. And adjacent, then brimstone, and the faces of the horses were the uh, heads of lions, and out of the mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three were the third part of men killed, not tormented, but killed now, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of the mouths. For the power is in their mouth and their tails, for the tails were like unto serpents, and they had heads. Uh, with them they do hurt, and the rest of them which were not killed by these plagues, they repented not for the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood and which can neither see nor hear nor walk neither repented they of their murders nor their sorceries nor their fornications nor their thefts that's the entire point of all of this is to get them to repent get them to turn back to God this is a power that is brought up by God to get the medieval Christian world to repent give them a chance to repent of the evils that they are doing according to uh, the other prophecies that the uh, medieval Christian world was doing at this time. So let's take a look in, in this part and get a little bit more detail. Um, the Ottoman or the um, Byzantine Empire soon after this 150 year period it was destroyed and specifically the um, battle at which Constantinople, the capital, um, was finally captured and destroyed um, was one of the first major battles to feature uh, cannons and it describes here that you have uh, the fire and the smoke and the brimstone or sulfur uh, one of the main ingredients in gunpowder coming out of the smoke coming out of the mouse so actually a very good description of destruction by cannons um, but they're loose for an hour and a day and a month and a year for the slave of the third part of men. What does this mean? Well, let's kind of start delving into all these things. Let's kind of delve into some of, uh, some of the others first. Now I said, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which abound in the great river Euphrates. Now there were four principal sultans of the Ottoman Empire located on, on or near the Euphrates. These were the Aleppo, Iconium, Damascus, and Baghdad. Um, with the commencement of the Sixth Trumpet, they were let loose to finally conquer the Byzantine Empire. Uh, this was the Greek portion of the uh, Old Roman Empire. Now, 
we have here the what does it mean by the hour and the day and the month here if we use the method of interpretation that we saw in the previous video that a day equals um, a year then an hour would be 1 24th of that would be which would be 15 days um, now the Greek actually does allow for two different ways for this verse to be interpreted translated um, it can be translated as either prepare for an hour and a day and a month in a year or it can be translated as uh, prepared for the hour of the day and the month and the year. Either way, it actually works quite out quite nicely. If you just say day, month, the year, uh, if we look from, remember the five months went from 1299 to 1449. 1299 was when the um, Ottomans began their Muslims were united under the Ottoman Empire and began their invasion of the Eastern Roman Empire or in 1449 was when the Eastern Roman Emperor had to get permission from the Sultan to actually become Emperor showing that his power was effectively dead so it's no longer simply but tormented but they were actually but the Empire was being killed from then on and if you say um, Hour and a day and month a year comes up to 391 years, which going from 1449 goes to 1840. Now, if you want to say that an hour and a day and a month in a year, um, the fifth trumpet begins on July 27th, 1449, uh, and figuring it that way would continue until July 27th. I mean, sorry, July began on July 27th, 1299, and continue on until July 27th, 1449. Sorry there for the mistake there. Um, so the three and so if an hour being 15 days, 124th of a year. The three and 91 years and 15 days, um, July 27th plus 15 days is August 11th. Then counting on from August 11th, 1449 to August 11th, 1840. So you 391 years. Then. Um, now, some of the people who were studying the prophecy at that time um, recognized this and actually did a little bit of predicting. Um, in the book, Great Controversy, by Alan White is one of the uh, witnesses to all this. Uh, she writes, in the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited worldwide, actually, sorry, widespread, sorry, widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Lynch, one of the leading ministers uh, preaching the second advent published an exposition of Revelation 9 predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire according to his calculations his son power was to be overthrown in AD 1840 sometime uh, in the month of August and only a few days previous to its, its accomplishment he wrote allowing the first period of 150 years to have been fulfilled exactly before uh, the Kozis ascended the throne by permission of the Turks and that 391 years 15 days commenced from the close of the first period It will end on the 11th of August 1840 when the Ottoman Empire in Constantinople may be expected to be broken and this I believe will be found to be the case and Joseph Cyber Lynch wrote this in the signs of the Times an expo expositor of prophecy on August 1st 1840 10 days before that the event took place uh, and Ellen White wrote at the very time specified Turkey through her ambassadors accepted protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed itself under the placed herself under the control of Christian nations thus exactly the event exactly fulfilled the prediction now a number of people have criticized this by saying that um, by pointing out very really rightfully so that the Ottoman Empire did not actually fall at that time it survived um, up until the First World War and that's absolutely true but we're not necessarily looking at how they how this group of people saw the interpreted that prophecy at that particular at, in 1840 um, but what's key to remember is what the Bible specifically said and what we can look to see if this event uh, did fulfill the prophecy and um, remember it's that the Byzantine Empire um, 
it uh, kind of the symbol showing its death blow was when the Emperor Constantine um, had to get permission from the Turkish Sultan to ascend the throne showing that he could only gain control over the Byzantine Empire with the permission of the Sultan showing that he was of, a, uh, of showing showing really officially that he was a vassal now um, the Byzantines have been have been under the thumb of the Sultans for quite a few years before this but this was a very official statement uh, recognizing that that the Byzantine Empire at that point only existed at with the permission of the Ottomans um, so if you want to look for a parallel then we would only need to show that the Ottoman Empire at that and in by August 11th 1840 only existed with the permission of an outside force uh, that its existence was owed to someone else that its power had shifted to somewhere else um, plus the prophecy only predicts that it's able to slay the third power man uh, that the hour and the day and the month and years when it has the power to slay um, and again this is perfectly fulfilled um, just we need something to mark when the Ottoman Empire was no longer capable of doing that slaying um, obviously it did conduct wars after 1840 but this but it, and it had actually been very weakened a lot uh, leading up to this but you have the same parallel in the Byzantine Empire by the time um, the Byzantine 1449 rolled around the Byzantine Empire was very small and very weak um, so leading up into August 11th 1840 you have the same you have a parallel there the Ottoman Empire was uh, quite a bit weaker and and it uh, did survive later on um, this is just something but just like the 150 years ended when the Byzantines did something to officially recognize that their existence um, that they were no longer in charge of their own fate um, the Ottomans here actually did something uh, the same and, and so it does still fulfill it even if um, some of the people in, in the 1840s didn't uh, uh, kind of got a little bit too excited and tried to say the Ottoman Empire would be overthrown at that time even though it was not so let's look at the historical record um, the war with um, Mehmet Ali was an internal Ottoman problem but it was now in 1840 um, you have the um, the Ottomans are at war with the Egyptians and the war with Mehmed Ali uh, was a was an internal Ottoman problem um, yes technically the Egyptians were um, anyways, uh, was an internal Ottoman problem but it was resolved through European education after much disagreement between themselves and Britain uh, Russia, France, Austria, and Prussia presenting at a united front warned the Grand Vizier against rushing into a settlement uh, with the rapacious governor. Uh, the Egyptians were the governor of the Ottomans. Um, and on the 27th of August, this is in 1839, um, Istanbul responded by authorizing the powers to negotiate uh, a settlement on the Empire's behalf and a diplomatic maneuvering then ensued uh, revealed the nub of the Eastern question each of the powers was suspicious of the influence wielded by the others over the Ottoman Empire and particularly fearful least another power should gain an untoward advantage whether strategic territorial or commercial a great deal of intricacy uh, Nuanced intricately nuanced negotiation eventually resulted in the July 1840 compromise. Uh, the Convention of the Pacification of the Levant, signed by Britain, Austria, Prussia, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire, 
France refused to be a party of the inevitable coercive measures against Mahmoud And so you see, you've got these outside powers having to come in and settle things for the Ottomans. Um, the Ottomans are not able to actually take care of their own problem. <coughs> um, from this time, British influence and intervention in the Near East burgeoned. It was not long before other European states were accorded similar trading privileges, but it was the British with their advanced industrialization and financial institutions who were best placed to profit from commercial opportunities now available to them. The long-term effects of this liberalization of trade were mixed. Foreign merchants had the advantage over Ottoman merchants, who continued to pay internal customs dues. The volume of trade, inc trade increased, but at the cost of undermining Ottoman domestic production, and primarily because of the loss of income from tariffs, or of weakening uh, still further in finances of Europe. As one historian, Autumn, as one historian sees it, the Ottoman Empire turned into into a virtual British protectorate. So the events. Um, centered around the July 1840 compromise turned uh, officially showed that the Ottomans had become a British protectorate just as in 1449 the Emperor having to get permission from the Sultans to ascend to the throne showed that the Byzantine Emperor was basically an Ottoman protected protectorate at the time is an official recognition that its time had come to an end. Just as this is an official recognition that the time when the Ottomans are like the, the major power has come to an end. Now, it, this is a July 1840 compromise, but remember the prophecy fulfilled on August 11th. So something has to happen on that day concerning this compromise, which shows that this is actually when it's really put into effect. Um, and, and this is because um, while the compromise was written up in July, it's called the July Compromise, um, it was actually delivered to um, the Egyptian leaders by the British who, had, who were, who were delivering a compromise basically written up by the Europeans and delivered by a European power on the behalf of the Ottomans. So, so this really shows that the Ottomans don't have any power here, don't have any authority in this. This is completely done on their behalf by uh, the British. Um, and here's the memoirs of the captain that actually delivered it to them and said, and, um, he says, on the 3rd of August, we took leave for Beirut and sailed in company with the Ed Edinburgh to join the commander in uh, Chief's flag, uh, leaving the Castor of Gar Gargan on the coast, thinking it probable that counter orders might be sent to Rhodes. We made best of our way thither. On the 10th, 10th of August, we made Castor Rosso on the coast of Caramania and there fell in with the Ganges, commanded by my old friend Captain Reynolds, who brought me direction. Uh, to hoist a blue a broad blue pennant and take under my command the Ganges, Thunder, Edinburgh, Castor, and Gargan, and return to Beirut. He was bearer of the treaty of the 15th of July, that compromise we just read about, and of orders to assist the mountaineers, uh, supposing the insurrection to be in full force. The Ganges was directed to pass the east of Cyprus and the Thunderer to the west of it in order to pick me up. All sail was made was made, and by noon the next day, the next day being the 11th of August, we made fortunate. We uh, were fortunate in joining the latter ship, and they made the best of our way to Beirut. They were going to Beirut to deliver the compromise. So it was on the 11th of August that they set out to deliver the compromise on the behalf of the uh, deliver compromise that was written up by the Europeans on on the behalf of the Ottomans, and is being uh, set out. And it was the Europeans who were setting out to deliver it on the 11th of August. Uh, so this is why the 11th of August is actually does mark the day. Um, because if the Ottomans can't even deliver their own treaty or comp or uh, agreement, then that really shows that their power has come to an end. Uh, so it's on the 11th of August that you got this foreign power acting on the behalf of the Ottomans to do all this.
Um, the service was rather of a delicate nature. The insurrection was over in 20 days were allowed Mehmet Ali to reject or accept the Treaty of July. In the quarantine ground two miles from Beirut were encamped 4,000 Turks. It was known they were dissatisfied and wished to return to Constantinople, um, which is now the capital of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, today's call it Istanbul. But how to assist them? How far to go under the existing treaty was not very easy to decide. So he's actually having to do things on behalf of the Ottomans, um, figuring out the best to go about it. It was, however, important to uh, important some efforts should be made before they should be moved before they were moved out of our reach. It was also desirable to prevent, if possible, the enterprising officer. Suleiman Pasha, who organized the Egyptian army, from removing the stores from the magazine and from strengthening the town. My position was not agreeable. If I commanded hostilities before the expiration of the 20 days and Ahmad Ali accepted the terms, I should be accused of precipitation and of causing an unnecessary sacrifice of life. On the other, should Ahmad Ali hold out, I might be accused of stupidness. Under this embarrassment, we anchored in Epirut on the 12th of August. So they actually anchored on the 12th of August, but it's the 11th of August they set out and actually approach Beirut. Um, so you can see it's the British are completely acting in the role that the Ottomans should be playing for themselves, but the Ottomans are too weak at this point to do that. Uh, so just to summarize, one woe is passed and behold there to come two woes hereafter. And the sixth angel sounder heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which abound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed and were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen was two hundred thousand thousand. I, I don't know exactly why it's specifying that number. I've not found a good interpretation for that. I know that's saying a very large number, kind of mighty invasion, um, but why it's being that specific, I, I'm not sure. And I'll be honest with you on saying it, I'm not sure about that. It, it is very curious. I heard the number of them. And that's what saw the horses in vision, then that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and heads of the horses were the heads of the lion, and out of the mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. And, and, but these three were the th by these three were the third part of men killed by fire and by smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths, and for the powers in their mouth and their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents, and their heads, um, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues were yet repentant now the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood. He neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of the murders, nor the sorceries, nor the fornications, nor the, nor the thefts. And that's you know what it says in Revelation about Islam. Uh, um, just for the um, public service announcement, uh, is not saying that the kind of uh, fanatical Islam that uh, America's are having problems with the last few years is good or from God um, but it does show that when Muslims say that these fanatics are not representing the true faith of Islam and that these fanatics are not representing what the Quran really teaches you should take them seriously um, because this is talking about the origins of Muhammad origins of the Quran um, origins of Islam um, and everything in the prophecy there shows that it, it was set up by God um, it was set up by God and not Satan um, and it should be taken seriously um, by those that really want to um, study God and worship God they should take Muhammad and the Quran and um, not what the fanatics try to say but look at the Quran itself look at what Muhammad himself actually well we know for sure that is actually written in the Quran look at what Muhammad said he received from God um, especially when this is uh, you have the 
the smoke of the great furnace and uh, darkness, which is the same symbols we saw when Moses received his message from God. Uh, Muhammad said that his message, which was written down in the Quran, came from God. And it should be taken seriously um, and should not be attacked or more summarily dismissed.